we are going to talk about the Laplace transform, the integral definition of this transform in particular. So what we have here is the integral definition of the Laplace transform, and we need to see that in the integral definition, we integrate on the time variable t. So the Laplace transform is an integral which takes in the data f, which is a function of t. It performs an integration in the t variable, and the integration is definite in that it goes from 0 to infinity. Technically, that's an improper integral, but what we need to understand here is that since it is a definite integral, all of the t's will be replaced when evaluating at upper and lower bounds, and there will be no time variables left at the end. There is, however, another variable laying about the problem in the exponent of this exponential found inside the integral defining the Laplace transform. And so after I perform this definite integral, I have a new variable lying around, which is s. So we think of the Laplace transform as an integral that transforms a time function into a new function in a different domain, and that domain is the variable s. Often people call this the frequency domain, since s must have dimensions of inverse time. Since we will transform our data little f into a new domain, we need to give it some sort of function name, and the function name, which is traditional here, is capital F, so that I can keep a mental tie to little f. All right, you might ask yourself, since this is an improper integral, when can I expect this improper integral to exist? Well, this improper integral exists so long as there are constants m and c such that f can be bounded above in magnitude by m, some multiple, of e to the c t. What this means is that f is of exponential order. Exponential order is just saying that there exists some exponential that can control, for all time, the size of our data f. So what does this mean for us? Well, exponential order means that there exists some exponential that controls f of t. This is important for us in this Laplace transform because here, in the Laplace transform, the data f of t is being multiplied against this e to the negative st, and so for some s value, I should be able to make this exponential decaying so quickly that it controls any sort of behavior from f when t goes to infinity. So if f can be controlled by some sort of exponential, that means I can find some sort of decaying exponential that will overpower any sort of growth in the f function as t goes to infinity, and that will cause this improper integral to converge. So that's the integral definition. We think about it as a more general sort of coordinate transform from the t variable to the s variable. But what's going to be important for us is how this gets used. Since it's an integral, it will have a natural way of undoing derivatives. Since it's an integral, it will break apart sums rather nicely. So if I happen to be working with linear equations, which is our goal for right now, then it will break over the linearity of the equation itself. But at the end of the day, we don't want to have to consult this integral definition every single time. And so what we're going to want to do is understand how this integral transforms common functions from the t domain to the s domain, and then make a table so that I know without having to do battle with this integral every single time, what fa functions map to it from time to Laplace space. So just above this, we're going to start looking at some common transforms. And we're only going to look at two so that we can see how this applies to a differential equation. And so what we'll notice above these notes right here, where I'm starting, is a section. And this section talks about the linearity of the transform. And so you should read that section, but I'll just note here that if I take the Laplace transform of a linear combination of functions, really take multiple functions, multiply them by constants, and then add them together, and that's a linear combination, well, we say that the Laplace transform of this linear combination is a linear combination of Laplace transforms. All that's saying is that the Laplace transform will see this sum, and it will break over the sum and say that the Laplace transform of the sum is the sum of Laplace transforms. Right? This is a common statement in mathematics. We say it about derivatives all the time. The derivative of the sum is the sum of derivatives. That's a statement that the operator, the transformation, the, the more abstract mapping of that sum is a linear operator. Notable example here are derivatives. Okay. Well, speaking of derivatives, it might be nice to see how derivatives transform, because since we're dealing with an integral operator here, derivatives might transform pretty nicely since integrals have a way of undoing derivatives. So what we're going to take a look at then is the Laplace transform of y prime. If I take the Laplace transform of y prime, I'll have this integral, and the integrand will be y prime e to the negative st. Right. That is the mu multiplier of the um, the data that we're going to transform with the Laplace transform. Looking at this integral, I see no straightforward way of doing it. Right. I don't know what y is, so I don't know what y prime is, so I can't really just straight up perform the integral. I look for u subs, right? But if I choose u to be y prime, then du will be, um, or then I'll have to search for y double prime in the problem, and there is none. And then if I take u to be this exponential, then I mean I'm not going to really accommodate this y prime. So this is an integration by parts problem. For integration by parts, I will choose u to be the exponential, and then dv to be the thing which I would like to anti-differentiate, which is y prime dt. So upon doing this, I get du is negative s e to the negative st, and then my v is y. So if I form the uv term, I will get y of t times e to the negative st evaluated from 0 to infinity. And then I will add to that an s times y times this decaying exponential. But since this is another integral that remains to be done in the integrals on the t variable, I can factor that s right out front. So talking about the first integral, with this first integral, I'm looking at the upper bound, and I know that t is going to go off to infinity. Well, I don't really know what y is doing out infinity, at infinity, but I know that it can be controlled because it is of exponential order. And since it can be controlled, when t goes out to infinity, I'm going to require that this exponential function beat any sort of behaviors at infinity with its decay, and that will get the upper bound to vanish. At the lower bound, t is equal to 0, and when t is equal to 0, e to the 0 will just be 1, and then I will get y of 0, so that's where this term comes from. So we can take the Laplace transform of a derivative, but we will pick up y of 0 as a consequence, but that's fine, that's an initial condition, and those appear in our differential equations all the time. Now, the real question is, what is going on with this stuff right here? Well, if we look at it and squint, right, we'll notice, well, 1, there's an s out front, but the second thing we notice is that the remaining integral is the definition of the Laplace transform of y, right? That's by definition, this Laplace transform of y, and that's what we mean when we say that it undoes the derivative. It takes this derivative right here on y prime, and it gives me back a Laplace transform 
where it's just y being transformed, not the derivative of y. So writing this in capital letter notation, we have s times y of s minus y of 0. That is the Laplace transform of y prime, and we see that there are no derivatives left. Well, another function that we will come across when doing our work with Laplace transforms and ODEs will be the exponential function. It is the function we've been using for like most of the semester, right? Well, if I take the Laplace transform of this exponential, I'll put an exponential against this e to the negative st in the integral. I'll notice that since the bases are the same, I can add the exponents. I factor off this t since it's shared by both. And now I perform the integral. In my next step, I'm going to write this integral in proper form for dealing with an improper integral. And that will be me providing a limit as capital A goes to infinity. So I now perform the antiderivative of e to pick up this prefactor of 1 over a minus s. And I will evaluate an upper bound, which is going off to infinity, and then a lower bound. So in the next step, here is my exponential evaluated at the upper bound. Here is my exponential evaluated at the lower bound, which we should recognize evaluates to the number one. Here's my prefactor. And so now as capital A goes off to infinity, right, right here, what's going to happen to this exponential? Well, it could blow up or it could decay. This would be a not very useful tool if I had my exponentials blowing up all over the place. So I'm going to demand that this decays. So how am I going to demand that this decays? I'm going to demand that this decays by saying this number right here in the exponent must be negative. And for it to be negative, I must require that s be greater than a. That'll make sure that that exponent is negative so that this is a decaying exponential. So this first term evaluates to zero in that limit, so long as s is greater than a, leaving behind this term, which is just 1. And so bringing that negative onto the 1, so this negative onto the 1, I can bring it into the denominator. And so the transform here is 1 over s minus a. What that means is if I think about a little table where I have little f of t on this side and capital F of s on this other, if I have e to the at in the time domain, I should understand that this Rosetta Stone is telling me that this is just 1 over s minus a in the s domain. And so now, whenever I see that, I can go back and forth. So now, putting this all together, we're going to solve this initial value problem, y prime equal y with y of 0 being equal to 1. We should recognize that this is just differential equations language for e to the t, right? What's the function where if I take a derivative of that function, I get the same function back? Well, that is e, but any multiple of that would work, so that's c e to the t. But then if I try to find the exponential, what should the multiplier be if I want it times 0, that exponential to be 1? Well, that is our e to the t, right? But we're going to take a look at this with Laplace transform. So what am I going to do with Laplace transforms? I am going to take the Laplace transform of both sides of this equation. That is where I start, right? So I'm going to take the Laplace transform of both sides of the equation. Notationally, I will say the Laplace transform of y prime right here using all of the cursive language. But when I get down to business, I'm going to want to use the capital letters. And well, what is the Laplace transform of y prime? It is s. I've traded one derivative in the time domain for an s multiplier. In the Laplace domain, I have undone my derivative structure because now I have y of s, capital Y of s to be specific. And then I subtract away um, y of 0. So that means I'm going to subtract away this initial condition, um, which we've said to be 1. Okay, so that's the Laplace transform of the left-hand side of the ODE with the initial condition put in. Now I have to take the Laplace transform of the right-hand side of the ODE, but the right-hand side of the ODE is just y. So the Laplace transform of little y is capital Y. It is now a function of s, right? And so if I solve for capital Y of s, right, that would be the solution to the problem in Laplace space, right? So if I solve for capital Y of s, I'll move this 1 over to the right-hand side. I will move this capital Y over to the left. And then that capital Y would have a 1 on it. And then this other capital Y would have an S on it. So if I factor the capital Ys and divide through, I will find out that capital Y of S is equal to 1 over, well, that 1 right there in the numerator, that's coming over because of the initial condition. And then S minus 1 in the denominator, that's coming out because of um, bringing the capital Ys together and then factoring them off, and that's what's left behind. But if capital Y of S is 1 over S minus 1, right, then what little t would have given me the 1 over S minus 1? Well, Y of t would be the inverse transform of capital Y, but capital Y is 1 over S minus 1. But what is 1 over S minus 1? Well, we know from previous work that 1 over S minus A is tied to, in the time domain, E to the AT. And so what is my A? My A is 1. So what is the solution? Well, that is E to the T, as expected.